Thank you, Tim, for the intro. And thanks to the foundation, as always, for supporting this podcast. I appreciate the fact that they feel that what I bring gives something to our population. Um, so I'd like to talk today about something that I probably never thought I would ever talk about, which is travel. Um, it's something that doesn't really come on to at least my wheelhouse very often. Um, but I, but that's, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, we're going to have a great speaker named Spencer. Um, found him through the internet, like everything else you do. When, you, when in doubt, you Google, right? So, so I Google and I end up finding Spencer. Um, we have today, I have someone also extra here in my home office here. I have one of my old, old students uh, who graduated, was it Eddie, a year or two ago? Two years. Two years ago. Wow, it's been that's all. So instead of Keely today, we have Eddie. Want to stick your head in yeah. or say hi? Hi, everyone. Today. That's Eddie. So he's going to help me out today with my, uh, my hands. That's really pretty much. It's going to help me move my mouse around when I focus on and talking today. So everyone out there, thank you for coming on today. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, those out in the, in the West Coast, um, I've, it's, I've been blessed. It's, uh, you know, we have almost 50 people from almost 50 states uh, on our podcast. So it's always nice to know that people from all over the United States is even, I believe we even have someone in Hawaii. So our next goal we have Hawaii. Our next goal is to get someone in Alaska. I have to get someone in Alaska. So, um, so speaking of that, you know, travel. I I hate traveling. I, um, before my accident, I didn't travel much. After my accident, I rarely traveled. Well, so here's my first question for you out there, out there, Ken. Or do you like to travel? Yes or no? If you can give me a little text on your on the chat part. Yes or no? Do you like to travel? Okay. So I get a lot, getting a lot of people saying yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, so that's a biased question. Okay. So no, get okay, one no, but... Hey, there, is, there is Mr. Zawicki there, my assistant. So he doesn't like to travel. But uh, yes to most people. I love to travel from Zane. All right. So I'm going to let that run through. So here, so my second, I'm going on a world cruise. Whoa, Debbie, you better, you better instant message me. I want to know about this world cruise. Okay. That'd be interesting. So, so the reason I ended up contacting Spencer was I thought, okay, if I go to travel, cruising seemed to be the best thing to do. At least that's my impression. So that's how I ended up hooking up with Spencer. But um, so everyone seemed to be pretty pro travel today. So maybe that's why, that's why you're coming on today. So here's my other question then. So you all like to travel. I like to travel too. But is traveling easy for you though? So that's my second question. Yes, no. Is traveling easy for you? And so we get no, 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 no. So traveling is not easy for, but everyone loves to travel. So so there's definitely this big gap, you know, in psychology, when I see patients, uh, uh, so I'll get a patient and say, hey, doc, I want to quit smoking. But I like to smoke. When I smoke, it actually feels good. But I like to quit smoking. Big gap, right? Big gap between. So I love to travel, but traveling sucks. Eddie, do you like to travel? I do. You do like to travel. Okay, Eddie likes to travel. But it sucks. So why does it suck? Okay, I'm going to tell you why it sucks. Yes, planes. That's exactly. 
Every time I go on a plane, they destroy my wheelchair. I mean, there's a lot of other issues about planes, but but the biggest part about traveling is the planes because it, it, because of the destruction of my wheelchair. Because once I get my wheelchair destroyed, that means I got to deal with a company that's going to call me and they're going to tell me, I'm going to tell them what is broken and it's going to be several weeks of uh, not having my, now thank God I have a backup chair. Now the backup chair, usually it's an old chair that's not really good for my sitting position, but it, at least I'm able to move around. I had never had to go without a wheelchair, but I just would go without my main chair for many weeks or months. Has that ever happened to you? Let me, let me know, yes or no, if it's ever happened to you. Uh, that you, the, the wheel, the plane, uh, it's every time, I'm telling you, I have not gone one trip. Karen says, yes, yes, not yet. Thankfully for Nate. I've not gone on one trip where my wheelchair has not been destroyed. I've seen them bounce my wheelchair down the steps, you know, at, you know, at the end of where you, right when you get on. Of course, you have to get onto that. I don't know. Why do we have to get onto that stupid dolly thing? It sits like a 90 degree angle. I mean, it doesn't even tilt back. And, and, you know, once they wheel you down to your seat, first of all, half the people don't even know they're going to have to lift you. You know, they're like, oh, geez, are they going to, can you transfer? I'm like, no. And like, oh. So, so that's why I hate to fly now here's the sad part <sighs> anywhere you go you, most of the time you got to fly there this country is so big which is it's a beautiful part about this country uh, you, you can't not have to fly i've been i drove i've driven to florida so many times it's just a way too long after a while it's like and every time i drive that trip i'm like this is the last time i'm going to drive that florida trip from the northeast has anyone ever driven all the way down to Florida? And, and every time they do it, it's like <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, it does look like Hannibal Lecter, doesn't it? Okay, Clarice. All right. Um, all right, so I hate to fly because, of, but not only do I hate that part, the other part is that I hate going, having to be the first one on and the last one off, you know, because when you're last one off, by the time I get to my luggage, it's usually taken to, the uh, lost and found section where I have to go pick it up. So, um, so you, when you're the last one on, you're literally on the plane for a while. Now, in doing some research on flying and traveling, you know, it may be even actually more scared because I've read some articles, research articles that interview people who flies a lot. And my God, they've had bow accidents on the plane, or they had to try to get themselves into a bathroom. I have no idea how you do that because every time I fly, I'm only on for a couple hours, so it's short. As you know, if you watch my podcast, I, at this point in my life, I have a colostomy, so I am not even going to the bathroom. I wear a leg bag. So everything's somewhat contained. The only thing I said to my wife was, man, what happens if my colostomy fills up and I'm going to have to change this thing? It's going to smell like crazy. And she's like, well, we'll deal with that when it comes. So luckily, we but in reviewing, people have bowel accidents or some people have fasted for two days prior to flying which you know which is yeah don't eat too much prior to flying that's that's i mean literally don't eat don't drink so i feel flying is like prepping yourself for a colonoscopy remember a colonoscopy you gotta like the whole day you gotta drink this thing and then you got crap out of the, the whole day and then the next day they poke at you for a few minutes and then you're done. It's almost like this torture. You got to torture yourself for two days 
don't eat, don't drink. People like us aren't worrying about having panic attacks. I mean, I work with several clients in the country that have panic attacks about flying and they're afraid that they're going to get on and don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a serious illness. You get on, you almost feel like you're going to die. I don't think people like us with disabilities even worry about that, about fear of flying. We're afraid that we're going to have a bowel problem. We're going to afraid we're going to have a bladder issue. We're going to afraid we're going to get dropped. Oh, geez. I'm getting way too many people having a lot of good stories today. So um, I hear some people even wear diapers. Um, they have accidents, obviously. Having to drain your bag, you know, you know, or cat yourself while you are in your chair. Man, these are really, really crazy. And these are things I'm going to talk a little bit to Spencer about having not to be talked to because you may have a caregiver. So once you have a caregiver with you and you're traveling, you no longer exist. You become a slug. And, and, and your caregiver just, and this slug, like myself, no longer thinks. So no one ever talks to you. They only talk to, the, to your caregiver, your nurse, right? The team has a whole bunch of stuff on flying as well. So fasting, catheters, diapers, having an accident, trying to get in and out the bathroom. I've read one article where uh, this female had to had an assistant, uh, one of the airline um, individuals, male, to help her get into the bathroom. And again, I don't know how she would have done that though, because those things are so small. What what, I, what did I relegate in the last 30 years and try, when I try not to fly? Um, well, one of the other things is that if my other fear was, I said to my wife one time, what happened if they cancel our flight right before, you know, time? Like I see people laying on, you know, in a, you know, in the airport for like nine, 10 hours. Geez, how would I do that? Just stay there all night? Um, so that's almost impossible. So what have I done in the last 30 years? Well, I usually drive. I don't fly. I drive um, nice places that are local. You know, within one, within one day of driving, it seems like I can bring my chair. I can bring my car. The car is packed to the T. Hotels aren't bad anymore. I, I, if I, I you always the for me, it's always had to be calling. I always have to make sure I call to the hotels to make sure they understand what it is the difference between a handicapped bathroom versus a uh, rowing shower bathroom. You know, because I had gone into many handicapped bathrooms which have like an inch, six inch step into shower. So. So, but most new hotels are pretty good. So I, I, I don't have problems. Now I am excited about cruising. So that's one of the factors why I brought Spencer here because I thought, you know what? I'm getting old. Being old, there, you know, the reality is, is that my, our lifespan, uh, you and I, is not like the same of most able body individuals. Um, so I like, I want to try to enjoy life a little bit more as I'm getting older. So I thought, you know what, maybe a cruise would be neat. Um, but I haven't been, I did go on a cruise 30 years ago. Um, that was so long ago. I don't really remember much about that. Um, and I, and I assume things have changed. Um, and so, so that's one of the factors. What, why do we travel? Okay. Well, why do most people who are disabled don't travel? It is definitely physical. They looked at some research and said, the more disabled you are, the harder it is to travel. So, and that makes common sense. You know, sometimes research is just pure common sense. So they compare people in wheelchairs to people who are blind, to people who are uses the cane, uh, a, um, crutches. And obviously it's harder for individuals to to travel if you have more disability. So the greater the disability, 
the more difficult you have to travel. Uh, one of the other things they found out is that people who are dis who have individuals with disabilities, when you travel and you're in a, on a plane and stuff, you don't want to be bothered with it. The last thing you wanted to be is social. That was like a common theme. Let me travel. Let me get in. Let me get out. Don't talk to me. Even though, you know, uh, so another reason why people with disabilities don't travel is financial. Traveling is, I would say it's a luxury because um, nothing's cheap. I mean, when you travel, you got to pay for everything um, like everyone else. Uh, there, you don't get a discount because you're disabled. So uh, you may get to the front of the line at Disney, which they don't even do that anymore. Um, I don't think you even get to the front. It used to be old days when um, you actually get to the front of the line because you have a disability. But they, I think they changed that rules with some other high tech technology now. But uh, so finance and you have to. So not only is the cost, but then if you're if you're a disability, you have to bring more equipment. You may, like myself, have to have a caregiver. Uh, so there's a lot of reason to um, have to have financial stability in order to travel. Um, so physical dis issue, financial issue. And then if you do travel, there's not a lot of great services. I mean, sometimes they don't have taxis that are accessible. Sometimes you don't. I think I was looking at one of Spencer's pictures where he must have been in one of the... Uh, Mexico places or somewhere they, they had a ramp to get him in looked like a ramp to get into one of the vans so I'm gonna have to ask him about that in one of the pictures that he may show today so but so why but so after all these issues that we talk about why do we still travel well travel traveling is a metaphor for something you tell me if it makes sense traveling is a metaphor for initiative meaning you can do anything you want, evaluations one's own capabilities, the ability to collect reliable information, managing a trip, managing oneself, and reflecting on all, upon experiences. I mean, these are all neat things of what people who write in tourism say, that's what traveling's about. That's why people want to travel. That's why people, did you ever notice that when people post things on their Instagram and their Facebook, it's always a picture of them traveling somewhere and there's a picture of them smiling at some exotic beach or exotic um, mountain, right? Has, have you ever guys noticed that on all your um, Instagrams and Facebook pictures? I'm going to ask you a question. Have you posted trips when you go on a uh, trip? Anyone has done that? Uh, yes, yes, right? Debbie says yes. Catherine says yes. So, so all these individuals that are going to say yes in the next 20 seconds. Oh, Susan. And she said no. So the question I ask you, those of you who posted all these, why not? Why don't you post things like when you go to a uh, grocery store? Why don't, why don't you post things like when you go to the dentist? Right, that's more real life, isn't it? It's mundane and not exciting. I don't know. When I go to my dentist, it's pretty exciting. I get to scare the crap out of me every time he has to give me one of those big needles. Have you ever given one of those big needles, numbing needles, especially in your top part of your teeth? I mean, that thing goes like right into my brain. It, it feels like it literally goes right in my brain. That's how they numb it. They they try to figure out which part of my brain to numb so that it numbs my teeth. You know, so or is it that my dentist uses just uses bigger needles for me so so i'm going to bring in spencer because i've done enough talking because i want i want to know the truth i want to know i want spencer to tell me what do i need to do to make my trips enjoyable i post if not accessible places debbie says okay uh bad access you're right you're right i i was in, at the new jersey shore and they were telling me all these things about oh we got these new new things on the ground on top of the sand that that you can row on to row onto the beach and i was like awesome i was so excited they got these new fandle things that i can go on the beach so when i got to that part of the beach to go on guess what there was 20 feet of sand before that part so they didn't shovel the sand prior to that part 
or the other option would have that new fango material start where the sand starts so it wasn't it wasn't accessible anyway so again bad logic there so spencer are you around do we lose you we're here okay there you are can you hear me yes yes awesome. spencer bloom chris he um hey how you doing everybody so i want to introduce spencer here i i was googling around on the internet saying handicap travel you know and spencer's face popped up okay and you gotta love spencer's face check out his hair i mean it, it looks like he's a perfect guy to tell you what to do with that type of hair you know so but spencer how are you doing today i'm doing fantastic uh just planning trips uh this morning and uh you know for me and my uh my customers and stuff but uh um, you know, I mean, what's better to better than doing that, you know, every day you, uh, so Spencer, tell me, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and, you know, and your, I guess, and your limitations, what, what happened? Where, where how did you go from, you know, your able body to where you're at and then becoming a cruise consultant or a travel consultant? Yeah. So, uh, my journey with my disability, uh, started probably about, uh, was 2022. So probably 14 years ago, um, you know, I was un unfortunately the victim of an armed robbery at a gas station, um, you know, and some, some kids tried to rob my car and, uh, um, you know, open my car door while I'm sitting there at a gas pump, put a gun to my head and, uh, you know, pulled the trigger and uh, shot me in the neck. And it uh, immediately left me, uh, you know, quadriplegic uh, C4 level uh, from the neck down. So, um, you know, I've been living with my disability probably for about 14 years, um, you know, and uh, throughout that time, I've been, um, you know, acclimated slowly, you know, the first couple of years was a, a slow acclimation, you know, didn't know anything about resources, didn't know anything about, um, you know, my disability, really, and it was just a learning process, um, you know, throughout the years, but, uh, um, you know, before my injury, I was very passionate about travel, and, uh, you know, I knew one day that uh, hopefully I'd be able to travel again. And, uh, you know, that day finally came. Uh, you know, I remember my first trip after post-injury, uh, you know, probably about three, four years after my injury. Uh, it was a learning experience, you know. I mean, I, I remember, uh, um, you know, I went to uh, Shepherd Center for, um, you know, to get some uh, pressure wound evaluated and stuff. So uh, my first hotel experience was uh, um, uh pretty crazy experience you know we went there with a Hoyer lift and uh we rented an accessible room we get there we find out the bed's a platform a platform bed we can't roll the Hoyer lift under the bed so you know the, we experienced a couple problems they transferred us into a, a suite and then um you know we found out that uh I'm gonna have to use a sofa bed in this suite here instead of the regular bed and uh come to find out my Hoyer lift was broken so broken at the time, um, you know, I had a power one at my house and I brought my manual one and uh, I didn't think to test it. So, you know, I mean, uh, from that day on, you know, I realized, uh, you know, I better be more prepared and better be, uh, you know, more planned, uh, do some more planning on it. But uh, my disability, uh, you know, it, at first I was wondering about all the things that I couldn't do and I was always dwelling on that. And, uh, you know, the first couple of years were kind of rough, you know, I mean, I was just like, Oh, I can no longer do this. I can no longer do that, you know, but then um, slowly but surely, you know, you meet a lot of people, uh, you know, the best thing for people with disabilities to meet other people with disabilities that are going through the same struggle, uh, you know, same challenges that you go through. So, um, you know, I mean, my first experience two days uh, after being injured, I didn't get to the opportunity to go to Shepherds or any center like that. But uh, here in Pensacola, Florida, where my injury took place, um, you know, we had a fantastic rehab facility, um, and I met this guy that rolled in there. Uh, you know, I had no movement in my arms or anything like that. Um, this guy rolls in there, sounding like Darth Vader on a ventilator, and he's like, hey, man, your shoes ain't going to get dirty anymore, you know, so don't worry about, you know. And he's telling me all these funny jokes and all the benefits and stuff of uh, living with a disability, and I'm like, you know, he had me laughing, you know, two days after my injury, you know, I thought, uh, you know, my world was over as I knew it. And then I got this guy coming in there. I'm like, 
thank God I'm not as bad off as him, you know. I mean, this guy's over here. Right, uh, right, uh, right, Spence. Spence, you know, I have to agree with you. I have all my shoes from about 30 years ago already still. Yeah. I, I never wear my shoes out, so I, I definitely agree with you. So I'm sorry to hear that you had you were a victim of a bad violence there. And it sounds like there's another uh, listener today that had it was shot in the neck as well. So that must be a scary situation. Um, Absolutely. But- yeah. And uh, actually, I mean, uh, the situation itself, um, you know, in those those situations, um, you know, my injury was actually a lot less severe than the majority of people. And, you know, the adrenaline in the situation that, uh, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you know, adrenaline is like a powerful drug right there, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I was 20 years old. I'm like thinking, you know, all these things run through my head, but, uh, um, you know, compared to some people that I've met over the years with their injury, you know, mine was, a um, you know, a quick and, uh, quick and easy injury, but, you know, other people have injuries where, you know, they break bones, they do all these other kinds of things. So, uh, you know, my injury was really, they just gave me a bandaid and they're like, uh, yeah, maybe you should wear this neck brace for a couple of days and stuff. You know, I did go to rehab after, uh, after my injury and everything, but compared to some of the other people that were in the rehab with me, um, you know, their, their situations was way worse. You know, I mean, somebody get into a car accident, they broke 20 something bones, you know, whereas mine was just, um, you know, this little gunshot that went through my neck, um, you know, kind of cauterized its own wound and everything you know they gave wow. me a band-aid wow. and, uh, so so the, you know, the, i gotta say it it's probably yeah. a less traumatic experience than other people you know i was awake for two days after that you know i never lost consciousness never lost any of that so um you know i remember in detail all of the situation how it uh, transpired and everything but um you know i gotta say my injury was a lot a lot easier to uh, handle for that aspect of it you know obviously i still had all the same uh, realities that were hitting me, uh, you know, bowel and bladder care, you know, you're not going to be able to do these things on your own. You know, you have to find uh, caregivers, this thing, that thing. But, um, you know, I, I feel like mine was actually a lot less traumatic than some people, you know, I mean, I was in rehab with somebody that was wearing a halo, uh, you know, bolted into their skull. I'm like, you know, wow. Yeah, you know, no. I'm like, Spencer, I'm like, I, I, had, easy, three, I had three of those Spencer. So yeah, yeah. I, I'd be one of that would be telling you, yeah, you had it easy, I guess. Because I, I had, had it easy, man. Over. It was a walk. It was a walk in the park compared to some people. So, um, so tell me, tell me, what? How did you transition from? You know, I have bladder issues. I have, you know, they're giving you a lot of things that you can't do anymore. How did you transition from? Geez, I'm gonna do something with my life, and maybe even make some money out doing it and enjoy life because I know you get to travel a little bit more than you used to. So, I mean, my first setback, uh, really that was, uh, that, you know, took me a couple of years really was transportation. So I didn't have, uh, you know, money to purchase a wheelchair accessible vehicle for, um, so many years. Um, you know, it really took me, um, getting a vehicle to actually, um, you know, start getting out and reacclimating into the community and stuff like that. So, you know, I was relying on uh, community transportation for uh, the first couple of years, and it was terrible at the time in my area. I'm from um, I'm from New York City, but uh, I live in Pensacola, Florida, and that's where my injury took place. So, um, you know, it's a little bit more rural area here, and uh, transportation is just terrible uh, at the time. Um, you know, you'd have to leave for a doctor's appointment you have at noon. You'd have to leave at 7 a.m. You wouldn't get back till 4, you know. Um, you know, and then I, I um, went and you know, completed some of my education while, um, you know, having to deal with transportation issues and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I realized, I mean, I can't be sitting around doing that. And um, so, you know, I definitely pursued my education first, first and foremost. Um, you know, I got a couple of degrees, uh, you know, business administration, uh, got a degree in bachelor's in marketing and stuff like that. And, you know, that was post-injury. Um, mm-hmm. so, so it, you know, I remember the days where I used to go a 20 minute ride on public transportation would take us three hours. Absolutely. And, and, you know, they had to pick up 20 different people on the mm-hmm. way to your location. So oh, yeah. I remember yeah, I those mean, um, days. You and, know, there was days, days I'd be on, on the bus. Um, you know, we pick up somebody from dialysis, they'd start bleeding on the bus and, uh, you know, we'd have to park there for 30 minutes, wait for an ambulance to come. I mean, you know, I can tell you stories and stories of just hours and hours, you know, four hours on a bus ride. 
to get right. to a 10 minute appointment, you know? Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and so how many people listeners out there, have you been on public transportation that took forever? I, I mean, I did. Uh, and I don't know, does anyone have those bad experiences like everyone who are either in the past or current? So, so you went back to school. I'm a, as you, I don't know if Spencer, I know you watch a few of my podcasts, but you know, being a professor, I am the big support of academics because I believe that academic is the way to get you to getting a job and having enough money to have a quality life, like what you're doing. So, so now that you have a, 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 a uh, academic certificate or degree, you decide why, why cruising? Well, I mean, all well, the I mean, it, it didn't start, it didn't start with uh, cruising or travel, actually. Um, my first job, uh, so um, I had vocational rehabilitation. Um, they, you know, supported me through my schooling and everything like that. Um, you know, they helped me out with some home automation, a lot of assistive technology. And um, before I actually got into travel and everything, I um, uh, was recruited by this gentleman uh, named John. He um, ran a uh, assistive technology company. So uh, before I even got into travel, um, you know, he recruited me and uh, hired me on because he knew I was kind of a nerd about uh, technology and home automation and stuff like that. After he he was the provider that provided me with my home automation system. So uh, before I even got into travel, I was doing home automation systems for people with disabilities. And, right. um, you know, at some, you know, after doing about 50, 60 complex, um, you know, integrations, you know, $10,000 plus systems. Um, this was before Amazon Alexa and Siri and Google assistance and stuff like that. Um, you know, we were using proprietary kinds of systems and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, for clients with the home automation. So I was doing that. And then um, I think Alexa is probably what um, got me into travel. So um, Amazon and all those voice assistants kind of... Uh, hey, don't say um, that too loud because you're going to activate mine. So don't Yeah, so th those gosh. things are actually, um, you know, if they didn't come around, you know, maybe I'd still be doing that and not... Uh, you know, working as a travel agent. Um, and and but, you and I would never have been a met, Spencer. That would have been yeah. a sad day in life. So, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, those, those devices actually, um, you know, kind of made it easier and more accessible for people to get some assistive technology to where, um, you know, we didn't have to, you know, do these more complex systems. And, you know, it got kind of tiring. Um, you know, the majority of problems, we were setting people up with off-the-shelf technology and, uh, you know, they're like uh, calling me more with password problems than they were other, uh, you know, things for a while. So I, right, I just- Right, right. Uh, Passwords are uh, always an issue. So <laughs> Yeah, so that was the number one thing. So um, a local travel agency opened up in the area. It was uh, um, an Expedia Cruises, Airline and Sea Vacation full service travel agency. And I just got on a whim. I just emailed the, you know, the lady there that was running that office. And uh, um, I'm like, you know, I love travel, you know, I'm passionate about travel. I've loved it since I was a child, you know. Um, you know, I've done a lot of traveling as a kid. I was definitely blessed as far as that goes. Um, and uh, I definitely um, just reached out to her on a whim one day and uh, she's like, oh yeah, we'd love to have you on our team, you know. And uh, it's, a, uh, you know, partially you could come into the office. Part of it is working um, working from home. And, you know, I, I, had a, I knew a lot about travel I was already planning people in my family's travel and trips and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it just kind of came naturally to me to, um, you know, maybe actually get into the business of travel, you know, working as a travel agent. Um, and, uh, you know, this was about five years ago now. I don't know where the time's gone, but um, uh, so, so. So coming back, to, so tell me, as a travel consultant, what do people with disability need to know in order to travel well? Um, so it, it's, it's really a case by case basis. You know, I've uh, worked with people of all sorts of disabilities and, um, you know, whether it just be, um, you know, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with individuals across the country, um, you know, with all those different types of disabilities. So um, there's really not just one thing to know for, um, it's really a case by case basis, you know, where one thing might not um, work for one individual, you know, I'll use a case in point, um, a case of the, 
um, this one lady that I follow, she's a travel blogger. Um, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I'll mention her name, but, uh, she, um, has, she's paraplegic or, you know, has the upper body mobility. And, you know, I, I hear her sometimes going on, um, you know, rants and stuff to the travel industry about certain things that she doesn't like in hotels and stuff like that. And, um, you know, some of the things that she complains about or not complains about, or, or, you know, that works really well for her, you know, I'm like, well, you know, that actually is actually an advantage for me, you know? So, um, you know, she might be complaining about beds being low, but, you know, I require, um, having caregivers that I travel with. So, um, you know, their number one complaint might be a bed might be too low. You know, we need, you know, I'd rather have a hotel room that has a higher bed. So it's not right. as uh, so you know, challenging on my back, you know? So it's really, there's no one size fits all necessarily. And, um, you know, planning travel for people with disabilities is really um, a customized experience that must be, um, you know, tailored to that individual. Um, now cruising, you know, step away from hotels and stuff like that. I really have found that cruising has been, um, you know, the most universally uh, accessible way to travel for someone with a higher level of injury, such as myself. You know, the consistency of the accessible rooms, the consistency of um, the accessible amenities is is much greater than any accessible hotel I've ever stayed at. You know, so um, traveling on a cruise is hands down to me, the, you know, most accessible thing, you know, uh, accessible way to travel. Um, right now. I, I mean, we talked about flying a little bit before, but sure. cruising in some ways makes sense because everything is where you're at. You don't have to go anywhere for, no. Food. Yeah. And, you um, have to go anywhere for entertainment. And, and your room uh, is right there. You know, the majority of people in the United States live close to a close to the coast, you know? So um, there's ports, you know, whether it be um, New York, Baltimore, Boston, um, you can leave from Virginia, there's a port that's within a couple hours driving distance from the majority of people in the United States. Now, obviously, if you live in Kentucky, you know, you're going to have to yeah, drive I don't know. So, yeah, eight, some nine of my, hours. Some of my like listeners that. are from Indiana and Oklahoma. Indiana, they're they're going to yeah. say, uh, Spencer, you're wrong. We are not That's, close to a port, Spencer. Uh, you're so. not. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, but more than half of the people in the United States are. Right. So unfortunately, you know, uh, I mean, there, there are some river cruise options now. Um, you know, if you want to sail up the Mississippi, um, it, it's not necessarily something I enjoy doing as much as I do the tropical weather since I am uh, with my injury prone to um, prone to the cold, the cold does affect me adversely. I'm, I'm unable to drive my wheelchair as effectively in cold weather. So I do prefer tropical locations and stuff, but um, you know, as far as uh, wheelchair accessibility on a cruise ship, um, you know, I, I'm able to rent a medical equipment uh, that can be delivered straight to the room if I need, um, you know, that kind of makes things a lot easier. I do travel with my own um, medical equipment and stuff, but um, yeah, you, you're you're answering some of the questions that were that's been posted out there. That you know, you don't need a doctor's note anymore to cruise, correct? Correct. Um, you know, if you do need oxygen rentals, so I do arrange some oxygen rentals. Uh, that's one of the things that we do require a prescription for. Uh, but aside from that, you know, if somebody needs a, an adjustable bed delivered to their stateroom, um, you know, unfortunately, people with disabilities do have to incur a lot of extra expenses that people that without disabilities might not. So, you know, that hospital bed rental, unfortunately, is not cheap and it's not provided by the cruise line. So, uh, you know, for my clients, I do um, have to use third party uh, providers that, you know, they'll set it up, deliver it to the room. It's a seamless process and everything. But unfortunately, you know, there's added costs for people with disabilities, um, you know, so... It's definitely unfortunate, you know, in the industry as a whole, hopefully you can maybe get over some of those hurdles. Um, you know, I'm actively constantly um, reaching out to the cruise line. Sometimes I don't get somewhere with certain things that I do. Um, you know, I filed a couple of complaints with the Department of Justice, uh, you know, to cruise lines because they didn't answer me or hotel chains, you know, so. Um, Spencer, Spencer, the DOJ right now is very busy. You do not Absolutely. want to give them more work, okay? I think they got a lot on your plates right now. 
right? Probably, so, yes, probably. Uh, but I, I, so, but it's putting that aside jokingly. Um, it, one of the things I noticed though on a cruise is that your rooms are a little bigger than most people, even though you're paying the same cost. We, usually we, we pay more for what we want and, you know, we end up paying for more in compared to other people, but this time, usually it's bigger. Am I correct to say that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, cruise line, like, especially for like the bathrooms and rolling showers, I'd say cruises probably have the, the, the most consistent experience as far as bathrooms. Now, um, you know, obviously working with uh, somebody that's, uh, you know, experience these you know older ships that were built in the 90s you know there are going to be um some limitations to those as far as the the space that's available but um you know some of these new mega ships and stuff they um you know have some of the best accommodations that i've seen compared to any hotels um bathrooms like i said mainly is uh super important um a lot of the clients that i work with are higher level um you know in spinal cord injuries and stuff like that so um you know as a bonus on cruise lines, for instance, um, most of their beds, they have raised beds with storage underneath the bed. Now they didn't design that for intentionally for people that were using Hoyer lifts. They actually designed that so that people could store their luggage, um, underneath their beds, um, out of, you know, out of sight and everything. So, um, that's pretty much a standard across the cruise industry. So, um, you know, there's not one cruise line where you have to worry about a bed where you can't, uh, roll the Hoyer lift under, but because, um, you know, they designed that for space constraints and everything. So, um, you know, that's one of the issues that you don't have to deal with. You know, you don't have to worry about the roll in the shower being too small. Um, right. You right. Know, there's a lot of, you know, Tom, I, I just had something that posted by Thomas. Thomas wrote that they even had patches for grasses for servant service animals. So, so they, so cruise lines even put patches out for dogs to take a dump. You're yeah, absolutely. Say. Yeah. I mean, um, wow. actually there's one, um, Cunard cruise line, which, um, does transatlantic cruises. Um, they actually have a dog, they have a kennel on their ships, um, where they have, uh, a fire hydrant, uh, for the American dogs. And then they have a <laughs> phone booth, a phone booth for the, um, for the, you know, um, I'm dogs loving and it. stuff I'm like that. It. So, that's um, great. that's, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, uh, but that's Cunard on the Queen Mary, uh, cruise ship. So, I believe they have a kennel there that can accommodate. So not only service dogs, you can travel with your pet, um, pet as well on on Cunard. Um, the space actually for that books up pretty quickly. But um, I, I, you know, I want to know who gets assigned to have to clean that area for for um, um, yeah people. So, but hey, um, you know, in in general though, you know, we're we're talking about, um, you know, cruising is a nice way to go. But there was a story you mentioned to me one time. We we're talking about flying and how you and I agree that flying is one of the, and I have to tell you listeners out there, they're never going to make flying easy for us. I'm telling you, it's not worth the money, right? Spence, so, it, it um, is just, so it's not worth the money for us. About there. flying. I mean, uh, flying is definitely challenging for people living with disabilities. Um, there are several organizations right now uh, that are working on making uh, flying accessible. Um, there's one called All Wheels Up. Um, they're a nonprofit that's working on trying to get uh, wheelchair, wheelchair restraint systems tested in the, in the cabin, which um, currently wheelchair restraints on a wheelchair that are designed for uh, traveling in a car, you know, by the National Highway Tra Transportation Safety Administration, whatever it is, um, you know, they are, they are pretty much at the same standard as an airline seat. Um, they're tested to the same crash standards. So, um, you know, there's this organizations like that that are trying to get the FAA to allow, um, you know, wheelchairs to um, wheelchair users to fly with dignity and stay in their wheelchair and, um, you know, allow them to board an aircraft without having to uh, transfer because, you know, that's the biggest problem. You know, people like you were mentioning that might have a black bowel accident, you know, you're a lot more likely to have a bowel accident when, uh, you know, you got people lifting you up and slinging you around and, you know, I mean, I don't have any issues when I'm sitting in my chair, you know, it's, it's, it's the times where, you know, we might lift me up or do something crazy that, you know, those issues might occur. So, um, you know, the luxury of being able to stay in your wheelchair, um, you know, kind of eliminates a lot of those, right. those but problems. Spencer, the, pro the problem with that, you know, is that we're going to take up more room. 
You can, you can, you're going to put a person in an electric chair and lock them down with, you're taking up several rows. You're taking up several spaces. Uh, it's going to um, be it, cost. It's going to be costly. Cost yeah. We've had, uh, you know, so I shared, uh, shared, shared that, um, you know, the progress that was being made on a, you know, a spinal cord injury uh, support group. And, uh, you know, I, I got some backlash, which I was very surprised about from some people that were paraplegic, um, you know, bringing up all those kinds of issues. But, um, you know, these organizations have already thought about that. And, uh, you know, they have the figures on how much the airlines are actually spending on wheelchair repairs. And it's, it's, it's a lot of money, you know, I mean, if they break the frame of a wheelchair, guess what, they got to buy your brand new wheelchair. That's, uh, you know, could be my standing wheelchair, you know, could be sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Um, sixty to seventy thousand dollars is pretty much the entire flight flights worth of passengers that they just had to pay to repair my chair. So, um, you know, as far as uh, maybe getting rid of four seats, maybe two to four seats um, to accommodate one wheelchair, um, that's that's a lot cheaper than having to pay seventy thousand dollars to buy a new chair because they broke the frame. Um, you know, on a power wheelchair. So, okay. so um, overall, overall, you're saying that the cost of not having to fix all the broken electric chairs will will make it not too bad in general. Even though, um, so even even with us individuals with disabilities, uh, uh, there's sub sub. I mean, you always hear me joke about powers. Uh, because I'm always jealous about the paraplegics because you, you, you guys and ladies and, and everyone else who are paraplegics can do everything. I, you know, you can bounce down steps, you can transfer, you don't need a caregiver. So I'm always jealous about that. So anytime we have an advantage over um, paraplegics and able-bodied individuals, I'm all for it. So sure. Um, and then but, um, I see some questions in here, you know, regarding, um, uh, traveling with the Hoyer lift and platform beds, um, you know, bed frames. That's that's the biggest issue. Anybody that uses a manual Hoyer lift is going to uh, encounter, um, you know, quite frequently. So, uh, you know, when I'm planning trips for my clients uh, using hotels and stuff like that, um, you know, I'll actually call the hotel and uh, um, say, hey, you know, can you send me pictures of that room? I, I mean, you know, make a FaceTime so, call with me, you know, this is part of the planning process. So, so one um, of the know, things to, to travel well is to be assertive and get a lot of information from where you're going. Absolutely. So yeah, the planning process for traveling with a disability is going to, you know, take two to three times more time than it would be for um, somebody else. But, you know, it, with proper planning, um, um, you know, the six P's proper planning prevents piss poor performance is what you know we learn in school for marketing and stuff like that but um you know kind of translates into traveling with the disability you know um uh you know you definitely have to go uh and do your homework and investigate into these uh experiences fortunately um fortunately i don't have the experience uh the the problem anymore as far as beds with um uh you know with with platforms and stuff because i use the over um, over the bed, uh, Hoyer lift, which, yeah, um, Spence, I, um, I actually see that silver thing right behind your left shoulder. Yes, absolutely. It, it's, um, it's that you, you got one of those things where you, it, uh, jams up against the space up there in the, uh, in the ceiling. And so you have an automatic, uh, Hoyer lift, um, uh, yes, I do it. And, um, it goes over the bed and it's, uh, it's called the easy span, um, pressure fit system. I do have another one that is, um, uh, doesn't have to be propped up to the ceiling. It's a freestanding Hoyer lift. Um, I posted a video about it on my uh, little YouTube channel there that I, I've been trying to work on over um, a little yeah. bit here and there. Now, do you, um, there's a couple of pictures that you want to share. Uh, um, do, you, do you want to put some up or are they available, Tim, um, to just to share from some of Spencer's uh, traveling uh, escapades? Before I forget, while you're looking that up, Tim. I know Tim, who's my our tech tech guru. I know he's been cruising a lot lately. Tim, can you share with us a little bit of your experience? Hey, Tim, do you, I, I know you you do a lot of cruising yourself. Do you, yes. Do you do you want to share a few few tidbits of what you what you enjoy and what you don't like about traveling? I mean, so just to echo everything that's been happening, uh, as you and Spencer have been saying. 
I've been cruising probably since around, I'm going to say 2006, on and off every couple of years. Actually, I, um, yeah, so uh, for me, I like cruising because I'm able to, like, everything is there in front of me. And like, if I want to go eat all day, I can do that. If I want to stay in my room all day, I can do that. If I want to go out into whatever port, uh, I can do that too. And really, all all the staff there is their 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 uh their goal is to make you uh happy and to make you as comfortable as possible. So, like, I mean, so uh kind of uh, like different from hotels, you, you, you kind of trapped on this boat together. So you have to make the best of things. And I think that's a, even a benefit because you get to uh, form these relationships. I don't think you, you wouldn't really be able to in a regular like hotel environment. So you're just on the ocean uh, with other people for like a week or so. It's a it's a fun time. And, oh, great! And, and great. Of all the things they're re really accessible. Yeah. So, so you uh, again, you're you're a big supporter of cruising as well. So uh, can uh, I, I can everyone see this picture on 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 the chat? Can someone give me an answer? Yes, yes, no. Because uh, um, Spencer just put put a picture of my backyard here. So I wanted people. Okay, so Spencer, tell everybody tell everybody about my backyard here. Oh yeah, so I, I'm actually a, also uh, as a hobby, I do fly drones, and this is just one of my uh, uh, drone videos I took. You can see the uh, accessible vehicle there in the background. It's one of my favorite places in Cozumel. It's called the Rasta Bar. Um, it's 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 you know an accessible place that's a destination that I'm able to travel by crew. Cruise right here is a uh, you know an example of an accessible vehicle. Ah, uh, that's the one I was asking. Oh, okay, it is a lift. I was like, wait a minute, I think you're going up on a ramp, but no, you're just. Oh yeah, there's multiple different types of transportation depending you're on where you're traveling to. Just weighing it down a little to. bit. Okay, that's nice. Um, you know, so uh, this is a uh, you know an example of uh, an accessible room. Are you guys able to see that as well? I and there's your lift system for your bed. I see there. Yeah, so that's a, an example of an over the over the bed uh, lift system that doesn't, um, you know, isn't affected by a platform bed, for instance, um, similar to that. Uh, that's you know, a big right room. there, that's, it, that's a, big a bed. Room. Absolutely, and that's the uh, bed rental right there that I've rented uh, through a third party company provider that delivers it and sets it up to the room. Um, you know, if I, I, I do need to sleep a little bit elevated just due to my disability and, um, uh, you know, that, that bed rental definitely makes it a lot easier for that. Um, uh, but we're going to do a, a, just a few more pictures and I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up this cause I know we're almost up to an that, hour. That's a nice, that's a nice picture of you in a, in a swing. Yeah. Room. We just, uh, we got a little creative, you know, typically we'll just find some people that are, you know, a lot of people that are under the influence of beverages, they're, they're more than willing to throw you in a pool or anything like that. And um, I'm more than willing to uh, accept their help. So, uh, you know, we just stole some kitties life vest and stuff and threw them on my arms uh, and uh, improvised a little bit and uh, threw me in the swimming pool and everything. You know, it's uh, definitely uh, possible, you know, here's some of the challenges though that you have to uh, deal with here on a um, different country, no curb cuts. So, yeah, no curb cuts. You know, there might be some dirt and everything. Uh, let me mute that because there's probably some profanities being thrown around in there. Um, you know, getting stuck in the, getting stuck in some sand there and everything. You know, this is just oh something that that we go through. You know, sometimes they don't have accessible vehicles. You know, but we're we're definitely going to try to. Um, oh, look at that! You gotta get some <laughs> you know, people. Get some now, people. You I, know. I have to say, Spencer, when you say getting people help from people who are intoxicated. You know, in college, I used to, my fraternity used to carry me up several flights of stairs to go to a party. The problem with that, the, the theory, the way you're using is that if you use someone to get you up to the top of the floors when you, before they drink and then after they drink, they forget you because they don't, they leave you up there because they don't remember. So I'm not sure that's a great way to hand, manage stress. So, so I'm going to, I need to sort of wrap this up, Spence. I want to sure. thank you for coming. Um, 
And uh, I, want, I want to at least point out a couple of things. You know, that psychologically, I know we didn't, I sort of threw it around a little bit here and there, but why do we like to, to travel? Well, tri traveling is a state of mind. It's a sense of separation from the everyday world. It's a freedom of choice. It's a freedom of pleasure. It's spontaneity. It's timeliness. You know, those are things of what we call leisure life. Us, people with, with disabilities, we don't have that. Because when we travel, we, we, we're afraid of the unexpected. We're we are afraid of being humiliated. We don't eat. We don't drink. We have no freedom of movement. So everything about traveling is the opposite of leisure. So, you know, I look at research. I'm, a, I'm an academic person. I look at research. And it says, you know what? Does traveling make you happier? Well, actually, for most able-bodied people, it lasts longer for them. For us with people with disability, it doesn't seem to last as long as most people. So that, what does that mean? That just means we need to travel more. But yeah, and, um, can I can I um, add something to that too? You know, um, I know um, you know traveling is definitely um, going to be a, a hurdle for a lot of people, but um, you know, start small with some certain things. You know, um, go to a park for a day. You know, go take a day trip. I mean, there there's so many things that are close to our community that you can do. Uh, you know, for free. I mean, the, the state parks pass. You could get an annual state park pass. Um, for free, you know, for life, uh, if you're living with a disability. So um, definitely go out and uh, experience some of those things that, uh, you know, you know, you got to start somewhere. So start, I mean, if you're going to start out small, just uh, start out small and work your way up to the bigger trips. And, uh, you know, eventually you maybe get a chance to go on one of those epic bucket list vacations, you know, and uh, right. Um, right. You know, sorry, we couldn't answer all of those questions that everybody had, but uh, I left my email in the, in the uh, chat section there. If anybody, uh, you know, would like to ask any further questions and stuff. I know John's, uh, um, you know, kind of on a time crunch here and everything. And, um, you know, but don't hesitate to reach out to me. And, uh, you know, we can definitely uh, talk a little bit more about travel, even if it's, you know, something you're not planning for five years from now, you know, um, they're, you got know, to start somewhere. Yeah, um, you can always do a Google like me. Uh, and you can look up Spencer or Expedia Travels and his, his, his mug shot will show up somewhere. But here's, I'm going to leave you with a couple of solutions for today's podcast. Um, one, one was do what I just did, locate someone who actually knows what they're doing. So Spencer is definitely someone that knows about cruising and travel. Uh, when I booked my cruise this year, I, I booked it through a big company thinking I have a, you know, best deal. The person did not know where it was going and did not understand my disability. So part of the, the problem with my trip is I'm going to go to an island where I can't even get off. So that is a perfect example. Of don't book with someone who don't know what they're doing. Go with someone that knows about disability and travel. Number two, I'm, I'm about academics and employment. It is not easy to travel without some financial support. You got to have some money and get back to school, get your career. And, and, but employment gives you a lot more than just travel. It gives you a sense of well-being, sense of identity, happiness, quality of life. So um, three, search for the information. You know, obviously you got people like Spencer who, who are quality, but you got to look up Google, look up well, however. There are so many traveling blogs out there, with, especially with people with disabilities. So use that. Uh, number four, change your attitude about traveling. I have to get over that barrier in my head. I don't like to travel. I think traveling is hard, frustrating. It is opposite of what I consider leisure life. So I have to change my attitude. Attitude is everything. You know, you have to be, you have to have a good attitude going into things. Um, five, take shorter trips. You know, it's not always about big trips. You know, start, like Spencer said, start small. You know, I, I do local day trips. Most of my trips are local day trips because I don't have to lug everything. My, you know, my next boat is... The, close. I'm going into Manhattan. It's not that far away. So um, lastly, you got to problem solve. You know, you get, if something comes up, you got to problem solve. But re remember, don't make the same mistake twice. So make sure you problem solve. Now, thanks everyone for listening today. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to me at the university and uh, please invite others to the podcast if they think, you know, your friends that, you, that are interested in um, quality of life and spinal cord injury. And I will see you next month. Next month, I have a great 
great guest speaker. Um, we have a, a, another individual. He's a medical doctor. He's a quadriplegic. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's a guy named Jesse. Um, I had an opportunity to meet him, and I'm looking forward to our, our January uh, podcast. Remember, our podcast is now on two, second week at 2 o'clock. It not, used to be the first week at 2 o'clock, but now due to my academic schedule, it's the second week at 2 o'clock. I'll see everyone then. Take care. Talk to you soon. Live well. Bye-bye.